Today we are going to be learning about the revolutions that happen after the American and French revolutions, ones that are inspired by them. Um, and so we're entering what some call a revolutionary age and what others call the revolutionary Atlantic. Napoleon first entered national consciousness in seven Napoleon first entered national consciousness in 1793 when he experienced his first military success at Toulon, fighting counter-revolutionaries. A Corsican by birth, Napoleon had been educated in France since the age of 10, and he associated as a Frenchman and as an enlightened thinker. Napoleon's pol political life, though, was almost stopped before it could truly begin. His commitment to Robespierre almost meant that he, too, became a casualty of the Ninth of Thermidor. The moderate government, which took control in mid-1794, the Directory, refused to give Napoleon a satisfying military post. They didn't trust him. And Napoleon was forced to pander to the desires of the Directorate in order to prove himself worthy of trust. Fortunately, Napoleon was able to do just that when he was sent to Italy to fight the Austrian army, which was still at war with France in revenge for the executions of the monarchs. Within a year, he had defeated the Austrian army and claimed northern Italy for the growing French empire. Now a French military hero, Napoleon suggested that France go to Egypt and gain control of easy access to the Red Sea, from which Europeans could sail more easily to the Far East. The directory agreed, and Napoleon was off. In a short time, Napoleon defeated the Ottoman governor of Egypt and claimed it for France. However, this victory was short-lived. Great Britain sent a fleet to fight Napoleon, which they did successfully. And just so you know, it was during this Egyptian episode that a young French soldier stumbled upon the Rosetta Stone. This is going to allow historians to finally translate hieroglyphics, allowing us to read what Egyptians had written a long time before. Now, despite this defeat, Napoleon returned to France still a hero and was immediately embroiled in a conspiracy to overthrow the directorate. The plan was hatched between Napoleon's brother Lucien and the Abbey Sayers. Yes, the Abbey Sayers from our simulation. They brought Napoleon in because he had the support of the army. The plan was to establish a triumvirate-style government called the Consulate, and Lucien and the Abbey generously suggested that Napoleon take the first round as consul. In December 1799, the conspirators were successful in their coup, and Napoleon became the leader of a new French government. If you're following along at home, that means 1789, we had a monarchy, and now, 10 years later, we've gone through a constitutional monarchy under the National Assembly, the National Convention, the Directorate, and now we have a new government, the Consulate. Now, Napoleon was quick to take advantage. Within four years, Napoleon would be crowned emperor of the French Empire. Both as consul and as emperor, Napoleon faced a variety of wars between 1800 and 1815. Collectively known as the Napoleonic Wars, they occurred as a result of the European powers' concern over French expansionism. And if you look on the map, you can see all of the places where the Napoleonic Wars took place during those 15 years. He's going to fight wars against various coalitions, which included Great Britain, Prussia, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire. He was often successful against his enemies, especially in land wars, but Napoleon will never win a naval battle against the British. As Napoleon defeated his enemies, he did expand the French Empire, but not without some problems. Just as the French Revolution moved through several stages, so too did the revolution in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, or as it's called now, Haiti. You can see a map on the screen of Saint-Domingue, and the economy of this island will be dominated by sugar plantations, and thus a large portion of this revolution will revolve around what to do with slaves in this colony. Initially, the central conflict was between the whites who dominated the plantation economy and the gens du couleur, or free men and women of mixed race, who basically equaled the whites in population 
They were artisans and small farmers who supplied food and other goods to the large plantations. Some jeunes de couleur were even prosperous enough to own a few slaves themselves. Many were literate, and having followed the events of the American and French revolutions, they demanded liberty and equality for themselves. In 1791, during the French Revolution, a civil war broke out between the planters and Jean de Couleur. And while neither of these groups have any intention of ending slavery, the civil war that broke out between them made an opening for a vast slave uprising organized by a Vaudun priest called Boukman. You can see uh, what we believe to be an image of Boukman on the screen. As a religious leader, Boukman had great authority among African slaves. While his position as a field manager and coach driver for his master gave him wide-ranging connections in the slave community. He secretly organized thousands of slaves to rise up at his signal. When they did so in the summer of 1791, they were spontaneously joined by tens of thousands of other slaves from across the islands, as well as by maroons. Maroons are runaway slaves who lived in the mountains. Boukman's slave army attacked the planters' estates, and 40,000 marched on the city of Le Cap, uh, which you can see on the image below, where whites and Jin de Couleur end up taking refuge. The slaughter lasted for weeks and only ended when planter forces captured and executed Boukman. In 1792, the French government sent an army to restore order. But by then, a new command for, for those revolting had emerged. Led by François-Dominique Toussaint, born a slave, but he had been educated and became a follower of the Enlightenment. He is known to history, though, as Toussaint L'Ouverture, which reflects his military skill. L'Ouverture refers to the opening he would make in the enemy lines. Not only did he have military strength, but his political, intellectual, and diplomatic strengths would be equally important in turning the raw material of a slave uprising into an independent nation freed from the savage inequalities of slavery. In 1793, the National Convention of France under Maximilien Robespierre abolished slavery in the French colonies, in part doing so to quell the rebellion in Haiti. This would be the speediest and most successful abolition movement in history. It took a mere two years to go from revolt to universal and immediate emancipation. Over the next decade, Louverture and his ragtag army struck at the French. He would also forge alliances with whites, Jean de Couleur, and the foreign forces that intervened in the conflict. By 1801, the Haitians were insisting on full independence from France. Napoleon, not willing to grant it. L'Ouverture, by 1801, had gained control of Saint-Domingue and had taken on the role of ruler, including issuing a constitution that freed all slaves. In 1802, Napoleon sent an expedition to crush L'Ouverture's new state. Although L'Ouverture was open to compromise, as long as slavery would not be restored, he was arrested and sent to France. The French tried working through L'Ouverture, who was captured in an attempt to use him to stop the independence movement. However, L'Ouverture died in prison in 1803, and the French were left on their own. As Napoleon had reestablished slavery on another Caribbean island, the Haitians were concerned with their future, and so continued fighting the French. For the revolutionaries, the cry of liberty or death took on a new meaning. Defeat at the hands of the French, it became increasingly clear, would mean a return to slavery. After 1803, Napoleon was more fully interested in European events, and he withdrew the majority of the French forces in Haiti, which allowed the Haitians to establish a free republic in 1804, making it the second republic in the New World after the United States. The independence of Haiti had ramifications throughout the Atlantic world. Slave owners in the U.S. were terrified by Haiti's example and would refuse to recognize the new country. And in fact, no foreign country would even acknowledge Haitian independence officially until France did so in 1825. And it took the U.S. until 1862, in the wake of secession, to recognize the country. It was the last nation to do so. Venezuela was even more directly affected. In 1795, a Venezuelan who returned from Haiti, a free Zambo, um, that's someone of mixed African-American Indian ancestry, 
led a rebellion of slaves and free persons of color, sending the elite of Caracas into a panic. A young man of just 12 at the time, Simon Bolivar, uh, would witness what was happening and later seek the support of the Haitian government in his own fight for freedom and would argue for the abolition of slavery. In 1803, partly to raise money, but also to divert Great Britain from fighting him in Europe, Napoleon offered the French territory of Louisiana to the new United States. The purchase for approximately 828,000 square miles of land was made for 15 million, about five cents an acre. Known as the Louisiana Purchase, the territory doubled the size of the United States. These new lands would eventually become 15 states in the Union. Notably, Napoleon did dismantle the Holy Roman Empire in 1806, establishing the Confederation of the Rhine, a confederation of the various German states in its place. The military tide against Napoleon began to change in 1808 when Napoleon made the decision to invade Spain. This action had long-term effects in the New World, more on that in a bit, and also on the continent. The war in Spain is known as the Peninsular War. What's remarkable about it is that Spain voluntarily allied with Great Britain so as to present a stronger front against Napoleon. The Spanish and British fought a guerrilla-style war against the French, who were in no way prepared to fight in this way. The majority of Napoleon's most experienced soldiers were tied up in this war between 1808 and 1812, and they were thus unavailable to use in other conflicts. In 1812, Napoleon attempted an invasion of Russia which was doomed before it began because of poor preparation and planning. The soldiers in this army were drafted not primarily from France, but from Napoleon's new holdings throughout Europe. They were Italians, Austrians, and Germans with much less loyalty to Napoleon than his French soldiers fighting primarily in Spain. Napoleon's army of 600,000 invaded in the summer of 1812 and planned to survive off of the land, which may have worked, had the Russians not burned their fields to prevent the French from benefiting. Additionally, winter comes early to Russia. Napoleon's army was not prepared for the speed of the changing weather or the intensity of a Russian winter. They suffered from weather-related ailments as well as a lack of food. By October, when Napoleon finally ordered a retreat from Russia, more than half of his army had been lost to skirmishes or capture. The weather, disease, and desertion by the time the army left Russia altogether, Napoleon's great army numbered only about 30,000. In 1813 and then again in 1814, Napoleon's armies were defeated by coalition powers. He was forced to abdicate his throne in April of 1814 and was exiled to the island of Elba off the coast of Italy as punishment. But Napoleon wasn't done. In early 1815, Napoleon escaped Elba and returned to France, gathering an army of 200,000 as he marched towards Paris to reclaim his throne. The restored French monarch, Louis XVI's brother, Louis XVIII, fled to Vienna, and the coalition armies once again prepared to defeat Napoleon. Napoleon met the coalition forces at Waterloo in modern-day Belgium in June of 1815, where he was defeated. He tried to escape Europe, but was captured by the British, who exiled him to another island, St. Helena, in the middle of the South Atlantic. Napoleon would die in 1821, but the consequences of his actions in Europe would be around for much, much longer. Obviously, the main impact of Napoleon's actions were felt in Europe, both during and after the Napoleonic Wars. However, this one man's work also impacted events across the Atlantic and Spain's colonies. At the outbreak of the Peninsular War, the Spanish royal family, Ferdinand VII and associated nobles, established a series of juntas. A junta is a government in exile. Additionally, Princess Carlotta of Spain, the wife of John VI of Portugal, claimed authority over the Americas. They sent representatives out to the colonies, seeking oaths of loyalty from the colonies. In Mexico and South America, the colonists resented the influence of the Spaniards, called the Peninsulares, after 1808, because these newcomers wanted to become the new authority in the colonies. This agenda did not agree with that of the Creoles. 
the Mexican-born Spaniards who dominated Mexico's political and social power. And so tensions between the two groups escalated. Some of the Creole leaders of the textile center Querétaro were organizing a raid against the Spaniards in Mexico. Among the conspirators was a priest by the name of Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. Hidalgo was not a priest in the 19th century Catholic sense of the word, or even in our modern sense. He'd been ordained, but his constant meddling with the authorities had kept him in trouble. The revolt had been planned for December 8th, but the Spanish authorities heard of the plan in early September. Determined to continue the plan, Hidalgo set the conspiracy in motion months in advance. On the morning of September 16th, Hidalgo rang his church bells and attracted his parishioners. He then proceeded to urge his listeners to follow him in the movement to preserve New Spain from the peninsular interlopers. It's doubtful that he went so far as to insist on independence from Spain, but his Grito de Dolores, or his Cry of Dolores, as this speech is called, nonetheless marks the beginning of the independence movement in Mexico and is one of two days often called Mexican Independence Day. Hidalgo's band of soldiers were made up of disenfranchised members of society, people who believed in the message but had absolutely no clue how to fight. The rebels were defeated by a Spanish army in January of 1811. After the defeat, Hidalgo was sent before the inquisitorial court of New Spain and found guilty. He was executed by firing squad that summer. His severed head was taken to Guaniato and kept on display for the next 10 years. Another priest, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón, was ready to take up Hidalgo's mantle. Unlike Hidalgo, Morelos was a good military strategist and was able to plan his attack in advance. He took Hidalgo's movements, which essentially constituted a peasant's revolt, and formed it into a movement with a set political platform. In September 1813, Morelos called a congress together and it officially declared independence from Spain. Morelos was formally recognized as the leader of the revolutionary movement. Unfortunately, a lack of resources crippled Morelos' ability to lead a consistently strong army, and he faced defeat at the hands of the Spanish in 1815. Like Hildago, he was taken before the inquisitorial court and executed in December. While pockets of rebel activity remained, the Spanish had, for the most part, secured all of Mexico. By the time the warrior priests were dealt with, Mexico was attempting to squash the rebellion while still implementing the new Spanish Constitution of 1812. Because the new Constitution provided all citizens certain freedoms, like the freedom of speech, the Mexican viceregal government stalled the implementation of the new freedoms, fearing that it would restart the rebellion. To their dismay, and it really shouldn't have been shocking, the Mexicans began to revolt against the stalling measures, adding to the periodic rebellious activity still occurring in the Mexican countryside. In 1820, Agustin de Iturbide was dispatched by the viceregal government to deal with the remaining rebels. Contrary to the belief of the government, Iturbide was in favor of separation from Spain. Iturbide and the rebels agreed on the plan of Iguala. The plan included three provisions. One, religion as in Mexico's state religion, would be Catholicism. Two, independence. Mexico would separate from Spain and form its own constitutional monarchy. And three, unity, full social equality for all citizens, regardless of ethnicity. The three colors of the Mexican flag reflect the three pillars of the plan of Iguala. Given Iturbide's popularity, as well as the fervor of the revolts of the 1810s, the Spanish monarchy realized that Mexican independence was inevitable. They signed the Treaty of Cordoba in August of 1821, which formally recognized Mexican independence. As the constitution influenced by the Plan of Iguala was enforced, Augustin Iturbide was crowned the first emperor of Mexico in 1822. Keep in mind that at this point, Mexico included modern-day Texas, California, and the U.S. Southwest. However, there was a group of Creoles who sought to revise the Constitution and create a Republican government. In February of 1823, these rebels, led by a group that included Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, published a plan for establishing a Republican government. By the end of February, the rebels had won most of the popular support. Augustine I formally abdicated, and Mexico officially became uh, the Estados Unidos de Mexico, or 
the Republic of Mexico. Although there were attempts to establish royal juntas in New Granada, um, that's modern-day Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama, in 1809 and early 1810, the push towards establishing them intensified in April 1810 when royal representatives arrived in Caracas. In response to the arrival, a rival junta was established in Caracas, which recognized the rights of the Spanish monarchy, but vowed to rule over Venezuela. Other regional juntas were quickly established, but the juntas fought one another as some preferred complete independence from Spain, while others remained loyal to the Spanish crown. A Congress of Independence-Minded Creoles met in 1811 and wrote a constitution for Venezuela. They then declared independence from Spain. This push for independence was led primarily by young Creoles who were strong proponents of the Enlightenment. One of them, Simón Bolívar, was the primary organizer of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. However, not all of the regional juntas were in favor of independence and a civil war broke out. Unfortunately for the newly declared Venezuelan Republic, the regions that remained loyal to Spain were on the coast, and the civil war cut Caracas, the center of the Republic, off from global trade routes. Furthermore, when it became clear that the Spanish would defeat the Napoleonic forces in Spain and thus be able to rule over its empire once again, whole provinces joined the royalists. In July 1812, Venezuela's first republic fell to the Spanish. The restored viceregal government was not recognized by the patriots, however, and Bolivar and his allies simply moved to other parts of South America and continued fighting against the Spanish, sparking revolutionary movements throughout Spanish holdings there. Keep in mind that these rebellions are occurring in South America at the same time that Mexico is also fighting for independence from Spain. In August 1813, just as Morelos was taking over the Mexican rebels, Bolivar re-established a Venezuelan republic, but the Second Republic lasted barely 11 months before it too was reconquered by Spain. Keeping Venezuela a part of the Spanish Empire was incredibly important for Spain. Like Mexico, Venezuela was geographically close to Spanish trade ports in Cuba and Puerto Rico, both important Spanish possessions, and the crossroads to the larger Atlantic trade network. In 1815, the Spanish sent a formal expedition to retake their colonies in the New World. The Patriots found themselves dispersed around Venezuela, and they established guerrilla bands to fight the royalist forces. Bolivar tried to organize the guerrilla bands, but their various leaders could not agree on a unified leadership. By 1819, a military impasse not unlike what was happening in Mexico had been established. The Royalists maintained control of the urban and wealthy North, while the Patriots had control of the rural South. In June 1819, Bolivar began a planned reconquest of New Granada. His army, including a group of British soldiers, advanced on the Spanish army. Although the Spanish had intelligence indicating that Bolivar was planning the attack, they doubted that his army could make the trip, and so didn't prepare a defense in advance. Over the course of that summer, Bolivar's army defeated the Spanish. In early August, the Royalists in New Granada formally surrendered to Bolivar. By December 1819, Bolivar returned somewhat triumphantly to Venezuela, where the Patriots declared a new state called Gran Colombia, which included the old viceroyalty of New Granada, as well as parts of modern-day Costa Rica, Guiana, and Nicaragua. Bolivar was elected president of this new state, even though parts of Venezuela and all of Ecuador were still under royal control. Even as the patriots were focused on establishing Gran Colombia's independence in the 1810s, they also helped various other Spanish colonies, including Upper Peru, or as is now known, Bolivia, named after Simón Bolivar, Peru, Ecuador, and and Rio de la Plata, Argentina, and the southern South American states gain independence as well. Unfortunately, Gran Colombia struggled to create a feasible state. Factions emerged between the Federalists, who wanted a strong central government, and Regionalists, who preferred to see the various provinces of Gran Colombia have autonomy or even separate, a problem that is seen in the 1780s and 90s in the United States when the Constitution is being fought over. Named president of Gran Colombia in 1819, Bolivar worked with the Colombian Congress to try and establish a working federal-style constitution in the 1820s. Bolivar pushed a constitution like the one he had helped write in Bolivia, but was unsuccessful. In 1828, Bolivar appointed himself dictator, but even that move couldn't keep the state together. 
He resigned from office in 1830 and died shortly thereafter. Bolivar is known as the El Liberator, or the George Washington of South America, because of the number of countries he helped gain independence. Unfortunately, later in 1830, the Union of Gran Colombia fractured into Venezuela, Ecuador, and New Granada. At this time, New Granada is Colombia and Panama. Brazil's independence from Portugal was the least bloody of the South American revolutions. When John VI, the king of Portugal, had been exiled due to the outbreak of the Peninsular War, he fled to Brazil. When he returned to Portugal, once Napoleon had been defeated, he left his son Pedro in charge of Brazil. By that time, however, the Brazilians were well aware of the independence movement sweeping the continent. In Brazil, this spirit manifested itself largely on the political level. By 1821, after most Spanish colonies had gained their independence, the Brazilians began pressing for their freedom. As they had done in South America, the British intervened as mediators, pressing Portugal to grant Brazil's freedom. Political activists in Brazil began urging Pedro to step down as the regent of Brazil in 1821. In 1822, tired of the wrangling and the hassle, Pedro stepped down, announcing Brazilian independence in the process. Thus, the beginning of the 19th century was a time of great political upheaval in Europe because of the Napoleonic Wars and in the Americas due to the various independence movements. Most historians analyze these movements as the outcome of Enlightenment thought and action, but even so, these revolutions had very different outcomes. While most of the new republics in the Western Hemisphere abolished slavery as they adopted new constitutions, this wasn't the case in the United States or in Brazil, which kept slavery until later in the 16th century. 1865 in the U.S. and 1888 in Brazil. The fact that the Americas were just starting to establish working governments by the 1820s meant that they fell further behind European countries in starting the next era of development, the Industrial Revolution. And since we've thrown a lot of dates on multiple continents at you, we do have a list of where things were happening um, where and when uh, throughout this time period. So on this slide, you see 1804 to 1815, and this slide, 1821 to 1823.